I want to start out by having us remember a time when we were in that social setting with some people that we were not familiar with, we did not know very well. You ever had that feeling while you're standing there and you don't know what to say? And you're just like, oh, I wish I had something clever. I wish I had something brilliant to say, but I can't think of anything to say. And um, anyway, usually if someone turns to me and says, well, do you have something to say? I say if I say something, I say something stupid. And then I look really foolish in the eyes of other people. There was one comedian in America who described being in that situation where he was just nervous and anxious in social settings, did not know what to do with himself. And so he said, you know, that's the time when I wish I was an astronaut or a cosmonaut. Because then, if people would turn to me and say, well, what do you have to say? Then I could say something like, well, I've walked on the moon. <laughs> you know? Wouldn't that be amazing to be able to come back with, I walked on the moon. The whole conversation would then turn and I'd be able to, to have an intelligent something to say. It's having a story. Having a story is what I want to speak about today in, in context of love. Having a love story. And there's no one that I can think of in the Bible that has a better story to tell than a man named John. John the disciple. John who became an apostle for Jesus Christ. He had a story. Now, um, when we think about John, for those of you who may not know who he is, he, was, he and his brother and his family were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. He grew up fishing. That was the family business. And so he had a father teaching the business, a brother to share the business with, and a mother who was caring for her son. She plays a part in his story. And uh, one day, Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee and he looked at these two brothers and he said, follow me. And they left their family business and their father and mother and they followed Jesus. Now these two guys plus Peter, the three of them were the closest to Jesus of all the twelve disciples. They saw everything that Jesus did. Think about the stories that John could tell if someone turned to him in a conversation and say, well, what about you? Think of what John could say. I have seen miracles upon miracles of healing, casting out demons, people being raised from the dead. There was the time when I went with Jesus and just a few of us, we went up on a mount and Jesus was transfigured before our eyes. He was like shining like the, the noon sun. What an incredible moment that was. He heard all of the teaching of Jesus again and again and again. He knew the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom. But he also saw Jesus get arrested. He also saw, he was the one who actually witnessed Jesus being crucified, hung on a cross, and he saw him die. He also had that as part of his story. But that was not all, thankfully. He saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus numerous times in the flesh, touching him and realizing that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then she saw Jesus with the others, watching Jesus ascend up into heaven. I mean, I would take any one of those. John had them all. 
as a part of his, his story as a follower of Jesus. Then a few weeks later, he was sitting with a group of people and the Holy Spirit came and poured upon them. And he spoke in, uh, in other languages and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he and Peter and the others began doing wonders and signs and healings just like Jesus did. And so, um, I mean, the guy I would love to be standing next to John when he's telling those stories, wouldn't you? I mean, that's amazing amount of, uh, and the thing about John was he lived longer than any of the other disciples. All the other disciples had been martyred for being followers of Jesus, but John lived to the end to a full life. Jesus, for example, was, was uh, crucified and then raised from the dead in about 33 AD or thereabouts. John, when he sat down to write his gospel, the Gospel of John, and his letters, he wrote those in the 80s or the 90s. So 50 to 60 years on, he has had a full life of seeing the church explode throughout the Roman Empire. He saw Paul, he knew Mary, he had to, Jesus asked John to take care of his mother Mary. He had a very close relationship with her. So just an incredible story. He could talk anybody under the table with stories of things that he experienced. But when we see what happens with John in his experience of being a follower of Jesus, he doesn't talk about any of that stuff. The one thing that John spoke about over and over and over was the love of God. How he had been captured. He had been transformed, transfixed by the love that he experienced from God. Do you, do you know, this might be something, you, this was something I forgot about, but the Gospel of John talks about love. This is his Gospel that he wrote. It talks about love 57 times throughout this Gospel. That's more than all the other Gospels put together. His letter, 1 John, references love 46 times. He just could not stop talking about love. What happened to this guy? And I want to ask us, all of us, this is a question for all of us. If we're sitting here, and maybe you're hearing about Jesus for the first time in your life, Maybe you've been hearing about Jesus, but you're still not sure what to make of him. Or you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. The question is, we are all, or actually the matter of fact is, that we are all looking for love. God made us to be in love relationship. And that primary relationship is supposed to be with him. The question that we have tonight is where are we looking for love to fill that need and desire that we have for love? Where are we looking for it? God created us to have a love relationship with him. This is to be the primary source of the love that we experience in our lives. But if we do not have that love connection with God, then what happens is we begin to try to get that someplace else. And we start looking to our relationships with others. And we just, you know, 
uh, just in the hunt, in the search, could be marriage, could be children, could be any number of ways that we are trying to draw in the love that we long for. And so often, and I know I speak for everyone in this room, especially for myself, that when I do not find the love that I'm looking for, I'm disappointed, I can be broken hearted, I can be hurt, I can be so frustrated with love. In the pursuit of it, I can just decide, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm just going to put up a nice wall around my heart. And I'm just going to choose to disconnect and not have any expectations of love of others. Don't you don't have to worry about loving me, but don't worry, I'm not going to love you either. And we're just going to live in this defensive posture and not experience the fullness of love that God designed for each of us to, to experience. That's why I want us to look at John. I mean, John, he was transformed, transformed by the love of God. And I want to just follow along with him to see what happened to him. How did this happen to him? And what can we learn from this? Now, what was John like when he first met Jesus? What was he like? Do you know what Jesus called James and John because of their temper, their temperament? He called them sons of thunder. There was one day when, when Jesus, uh, with his disciples, wanted to pass through a town. And the people said, no, go around our town. You're not welcome here. It was James and John that turned to Jesus and said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire and wipe these people out? Jesus turns and rebukes them. The scripture here is not Luke 9, 54 and 55. Listen to what Jesus says. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. A little bit later, the disciples were arguing with each other as who was the greatest among them. And John and James you know, were able to double team the other uh, disciples and outnumber them. We see this sometimes with kids, you know, they, brothers and sisters, they can kind of win when they're in another group of people, you know, like this. So James and John are proving beyond the point that they're really the most important. In fact, one day they came to Jesus and asked him, Jesus, we have a request of you. And what's that? We want to sit on your right and on your left side in your kingdom. Can we do that? Jesus said, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, you have no idea what you're talking about. But let's look at what it says, how Jesus responds to them in Mark chapter 10. When the other disciples heard that, Matthew, uh, that James and John had tried to get this special request. They were upset with these two. Now the question is why were they upset? Because those guys thought of it first. You know, that they were going to get ahead of them. So you could see that there was this, this struggle for position, for power, for authority. That was what they understood when they heard Jesus talking about the kingdom. So this is what Jesus says. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. But Jesus calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know 
that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now we need to listen to what Jesus is saying here. In the late previous scripture he said, the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. His purpose and plan was salvation, to save people. Then he says, he did not himself come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a payment for many. Notice what he's saying. He's countering their, uh, their quest for power and authority and their, their fiery tempers. He's saying, if you want to make it in my kingdom, this is the, the way that I need for you to be. Because Jesus came into the world to reveal to us the love of God for his creation and the way he demonstrated that friends was uh, saving people serving people not being served but giving his life up for the sake of others this is the kind of love that God has the love of God, as was witnessed through Jesus, is self-giving, self-sacrificing love. It's a willingness to lay down my life for the sake of another. This is God's love. This is not human love, by the way, in case you were wondering. This is clearly something unique to God. And so John and probably only after the resurrection, and probably only after he received the Holy Spirit of God in him, did he begin to understand the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love that God had for him. Listen to some of the things that he says in his love letter, 1 John. We know by the way, we always remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Just put a number one in front of it. First John 3.16, that's also a great verse to remember. We know love by this. Now listen here. How do we know love? We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. A little bit later in the letter, he writes again, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. By this, the love of God was manifested, or was made visible and made clear to and in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the satisfaction for our sins. Are you starting to hear this? He came not to destroy, but to save. He came not to be served, but to serve. He, gave to give, he came to give his life a ransom. He laid down his life for us. This is how we know love. And we know love is clear and visible in that Jesus was sent into the world that we might live in him and that he might be a payment 
satisfaction for us. Now this, this doesn't sound like the love that we get in the movies, is it? Are you hearing any of this? I think it's just any movie, you know, this is not the love that we see there. Love in the movies is all about romance and about filling my needs. It's, it's really the focus is on me and what can I achieve and, and get and, and what can you give to me, what can I give to you. But the love of God is a completely different kind of love. And I want to come in now on a couple of verses that are just, they just grabbed me this week. Because I believe that it, John did not figure this out right away. And friends, none of us does. It's a process of understanding the love of God for us. Listen to these words that John wrote in uh, chapter 4, verse 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. I'm going to read that again. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. What is he saying here? We have come to know. That's process. Okay? Now there's a couple of different words that you can use in the Greek to express knowing, that we know something. The one that we're familiar with in, in our academy is knowledge based on observations, gathering of information. I know a lot about something because I looked up all of the information. That's a knowing. But there's another kind of knowing, and it's the knowing that John is using here. And this knowing is completely different. It means to, um, it's knowledge that is gained by personal experience. That's a completely different kind of knowledge. It is something that we experience in our lives. It's something that happens to us. And we, we I understand and I know something because it happened to me. It's not something that I gathered information about. That's fine. But for love, it's something that we must experience. It's experiential. It's relational. There's an intimacy involved in this where someone is relating to us in a way that we can personally understand and experience. And John says, we have come to know by experience. And once he had the experience, he then believed. Believed in what? Believed the love. The love which God has for us. So what he's saying is that he experienced different in different ways from Jesus and then after through the Holy Spirit and over the course of his following Jesus experienced in many different ways the love that God had for him. And he experienced it enough to where he could say, I now believe in this love. I, have, I can rely on this love. I can put weight on this love because it is real. It is there. It is something that I have experienced and I know I have faith in it. There's a very strong connection between experience and faith, friends. And he came, this John came to a place where he knew he could rely on the love of God. He had full confidence in God's love for him. Now I heard from a friend this week an interesting story and I went to research it a little bit more and that was that uh, um, children that grow up 
in unstable environments, in a troubled home, or in an orphanage, or you go to the sub-Sahara of Africa today, there are 28 million children who wake up every morning and they have no idea if they're going to get to eat food that day. They experience something called food insecurity. And, and so there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis of, of physical and emotional proportions for small children when they're never sure if they're going to get a meal. And they follow some of these children when they get adopted by a loving family. And they come into the family and they begin to engage in certain kinds of behaviors when they come from a uh, food insecurity experience. They do things like they hide food in their room. Which makes sense, right? They're hiding and, and, and hoarding. We call that hoarding in English. They also, when there is food, they eat it really fast. Because they want to make sure they get their part. And that nobody's going to take it from them. They eat too much, usually. And they even can be stealing food from places and, and things like this. All of these behaviors make perfect sense when they have been traumatized in, this, in the area of food. But here they are in a family that is feeding them. Now these families oftentimes get instruction. You, you feed them three, four, five times a day. You give them plenty of food. You make sure that the atmosphere around the time you're eating is calm, relaxed, and full of love. And you never deprive them of food. And what happens is over time, they begin to realize something. Oh, oh, there's food. I, I, I can count on this. I can believe in this. You see what I'm saying? It's something that they're receiving on a consistent basis over a period of time. It can take some children weeks, other children months, even longer, before they finally have that sense of, okay, I'm experiencing the provision of food enough where I can finally relax and I don't need to steal food, hide food, you know, eat it too fast, and all of these other behaviors, all that stuff drops away because they believe. The same thing is true with God's love. We hear about it, but if we don't have experiential knowledge that we, we have received the love of God pouring into our hearts, then, you know, it's very difficult to believe this love, to trust that love, to lean into that love, to depend on that love. It's like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing other kinds of behaviors. I'm gonna be hoarding, I'm gonna get some love over here, some love over there. I'm gonna have stuff stashed in every corner of my life because I can't be sure that this love of God is enough for me. John, <laughs> over a long period of time, discovered something. The love of God is enough. It fills me. It, it, it satisfies me. The deepest longings of my heart. I feel the presence of God. Not always, and here's the thing. Because you don't always feel the love of somebody else. For example, those children five, six years down the road and they're, you know, they've got over their food anxieties, there might be a time when there is not enough food on the table. And that's okay. Or they have to share with brothers and sisters and they don't get enough. And they're okay at that point. Why? Because they have faith. They have belief. They've established that. 
I can, I know, and I have faith, and I believe that God loves me. Because I've had experiences all, all along the way over the many years I've been following Jesus. But I don't experience, you know, some kind of vibrating, you know, something type of love every single day of my life. I just don't. That's when I have to say, but I know that he loves me. Because his word tells me that he loves me. And I believe and I'm secure in that. The love of God changed John to the point where all he could ever talk about was this love. If you have not read 1 John in a while, I encourage you to do so. And just notice how much he talks about love. He's not talking about, hey, the day when I was with Jesus on Transfiguration, well, I was right there. I, no, 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 no. It's nothing about himself after so many years. But it's all about Jesus. It's all about the love. He talked about love, love, love. I was, I was uh, talking with some guys this week, and there was, I read this somewhere. A, uh, about John, an imaginary conversation with this John the Apostle. And someone was asking John, 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 all you ever talk about is love. Is there anything else that you can talk about? And he goes, oh yes, I can tell you this, God loves you. <laughs> That's pretty much right, on the money. You see, when you're so captivated, so captured by the love of God, nothing else matters. People, I, you know, I don't have to lean in on my relationships with other people. They can disappoint me, and they do, and I disappoint others. It's a true story. I <laughs> just ask my wife. And, you know, that's just the nature of human relationships. We can be selfish, we can be tired, we can be sick, we can be all kinds of things. And we really do not have, we, we don't deliver. And do, the love doesn't get delivered to us in the way that we're hoping for. That's okay if we are first receiving that self-sacrificial, self-giving, a love of God, when we realize what length and breadth and height and depth that he went to reach me, to find me, to rescue me, to save me, and bring me into his kingdom, I'm captivated by that love. It says in another place, the love of Christ controls me. I mean, it, 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 it moves me. Not I'm not controlled by it in some unhealthy way, but the fact that it just, it moves me to respond to God in obedience to his word. So we have this son of thunder, this guy elbowing his way to try to get positions of authority and power at the beginning when he first met Jesus. And by the time we come to the end of his life, he is the apostle of love. And all he can talk about is love. Do you know, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written uh, like 50 or 60. Uh, Jesus raised from the dead in 33. And these, these Gospels were put together 20 or 30 years later. John's Gospel wasn't written till, until much later. And you know, the unique feature about John's Gospel is that when he refers to himself, do you know how he refers to himself? He never calls himself by name. He only says, and the disciple that Jesus loved. And the disciple that Jesus loved. I, I believe he understood that not in 
the time that he was with Jesus, but he was when he was writing his gospel years later, and he knew from all his life experience of being loved by God, how much God loved him, and he understood himself as the beloved, the beloved one. I am the disciple that Jesus loved. That's just, that's just amazing. And I just want to... Uh, Look at 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, and he did, and he continues to love, we also ought to love one another. Oh, oh so that's how it's supposed to work. You get the order? We received and, and have that right love relationship with God and then we are able to love one another. That's where the love is flowing from. Better is a fountain that is within us, a fountain of water. Jesus calls it that with the woman at the well who had five different marriages and she was living with the sixth guy. What is this woman looking for? She's looking for love. She's looking for love, baby, in all the wrong places. But her heart is desperate for love. And then she runs into Jesus. And Jesus goes right to the source of her desire. Says, what you need, I can give to you rivers of living water. That when you drink this water, you will never thirst again. Wow. What's he talking about? He's talking about the love of God. The love of God. Friends, we cannot give to others what we ourselves do not have. Cannot give what we do not have. And what we need, God gives in abundance, never ending love. And He demonstrates it to us through Jesus Christ. He, when He sacrificed Himself so that you and I, who are separated from God, in relationship to God because of our sin. Jesus, in love, took the penalty of that sin upon himself. That is why he went to the cross. That is why he died this terrible death. That is why he shed his blood. Because that was the payment for our sin, is death. And he took that for us so that we could be reconciled to God and be put back into that right relationship with God, that love relationship with God. And that is how, that is the reason why Jesus did what he did. This, my dear friends, is why they call it good news. This is good news. This is good news. So as we close here, what is our story? The astronaut, he had his story. That was a cool story. John, well, he had his stories. One after the other. But really he only had one story that he told again and again and again. Because God is love. And he loves me. And I love you. And it's all about love. Is this our story? Is that our story? Or are we looking for it in all the wrong places? There's nothing wrong with having relationships in human level. God designed us for that. Nothing wrong about that at all. Where we have problems 
It's when we reverse the order and I seek love from you, I demand it from you, I expect you to meet my needs, and God is kind of off on the side somewhere. No, it's not how it works. We receive the love of God, we experience it, we even believe it. And then, from that secure place of love from God, we can love one another. All the love of one another is flow out of first receiving the love of God. Is that your story? My story? My story is more of the building walls story. That's more of my you know, building edifices and walls and barriers, making it difficult for people to love me. That was what I have to come out of this castle, this fortress, and begin to take risks and allow God to begin to love me. And, and so that has been my life experience. But what is yours? Where are we in relationship to the self-sacrificing, self-giving, serving rather than being served love of God that is ever-present for every one of us right now? If you have never opened yourself up to receive the love of God, He's right here. And he is ready to come in to you and to your life and begin to have to that love relationship with you. If you want it, he's available. He's right here. Or if you've wandered away from God and you've been looking for love in all the other ways, on the horizontal plane in some other way, God is calling us back and saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you that love that you're looking for. Start with me. Seek first the kingdom of God and all this other stuff I will add unto you in the appropriate time. Come to me first. This, this is love, a love of God. This is what's available to us. That's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago, as he opened the door to love. Please stand with me and let's pray.